Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and I'm happy to be here today. I'll get started right away. <clears throat> All right, so to begin with, General Grant issued an order. The Jews, as a class, violating every regulation of trade established by the Treasury Department and also department orders are hereby expelled from the department. Now, anti-Semitism, anti-Jewishness during the Civil War has never been quantified. We know it existed. We don't know how much. But this, perhaps, was the most anti-Semitic action ever taken by an official government employee ever, even up till today. What was this all about? What was his department that Jews were being expelled from? It was his theater of operation, which included the states of Kentucky, Tennessee, northern Alabama, and northern Mississippi. Did he really mean to expel all Jews from those areas? And the answer is yes. Uh, initially, within a week, uh, soldiers went into Holly Springs, Mississippi to expel Jewish families from that city. The Confederates attacked the Union troops and they had to skedaddle and it left the Jewish families in place in Holly Springs. The Jewish families in Paducah, Kentucky were not so lucky. The army came in, told them they had 24 hours to leave, they had to pack up all their stuff and all 30 families headed toward Indiana to get out of Kentucky. One of those family members, perhaps more, got on a train, got to Washington, D.C., met with their representative, and got a meeting with Lincoln. He met with Lincoln, and Lincoln was appalled by the order and had it revoked. So the order was in place from December 17th, 1862, for just two and a half weeks until January 4th, 1863. And at that point, it was revoked. So what was behind this order? Why did Grant want to get rid of all the Jews out of his theater of operation? And a general, James Wilson, who worked with Grant, said it was related to Grant's own difficulty with his family, Jesse Root uh, Grant. His father had entered into a business relationship with four Jewish merchants from Cincinnati. And the agreement was uh, Jesse Grant would try to get permission to get cotton, get permission from his son to get cotton from the South for these four merchants who were in the textile industry. He approached his son. His son not only did not grant permission because he didn't want the South to get any money for their cotton because the money was going to the war effort. So he denied uh, permission to get cotton and he was fuming, and it was the very next day he issued this order. According to General Wilson, he said Grant could not deal with, quote, relatives who were trying to use him, and perhaps he related people who were trying to use him with these four merchants who happened to be Jewish. So he issued the order of Jews as a class, when he should have probably ordered uh, buyers and speculators of cotton, regardless of religion, from his theater of operation. Uh, but that's the way history ended up. <clears throat> Anti-Semitism kind of died down for a couple decades as far as looking at articles in newspapers and magazines. There wasn't a lot for the couple decades after the Civil War. In the 1890s, it kind of cropped its ugly head again. and. Here's an article from 1891 from the North American Review. And just looking at the middle here, uh, the author of this article said, I learned of no place where they, Jewish soldiers, stood shoulder to shoulder except in General Sherman's department, and he promptly ordered them out of it for speculating on cotton and carrying information to the Confederates. Well, that's kind of a gross misrepresentation of what actually happened. He went on to say, 
If so many Jews fought so bravely for their adopted country, surely their champion ought to come, ought to be able to give the names of the regiments they condescended to serve, accept service in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, using the word condescended uh, is kind of a negative word. But anyway, as a champion, did show up, and his name was Simon Wolf. Uh, Simon Wolf read the article. Uh, he responded with a letter identifying 75 Jewish soldiers by name who he knew. And he also mentioned uh, the 82nd Illinois Infantry and the 11th New York Infantry as being Jewish regiments. Well, he was wrong. Uh, they were both sponsored by Jewish organizations which came up with the money to recruit these regiments, but there was no regiment, no company in the United States which had a majority of Jews because the Jewish population was too small. So he was wrong on that, but he did name 75 and he re uh, received so much positive uh, reinforcement from this letter that they encouraged him to write a book listing all the Jews that he could find. And he did research, and he came up with a book called The American Jew as Patriot, Soldier, and Citizen uh, in 1895. This was the first effort ever to classify Jewish soldiers. Uh, he listed about 7,200 names, uh, and he, they came from all states, including the Confederacy. So who was Simon Wolf? Uh, just briefly, he was born in Bavaria in 1836, came to this country at age 12, settled, settled in Urichville, Ohio, uh, got his law degree at uh, Ohio Law College of Cleveland. After graduating, he moved immediately to Washington, D.C., and he started to befriend presidents. He actually became known as the de facto ambassador of the Jewish people to the presidency. He knew all presidents from Buchanan to Wilson. He had a personal relationship. Now, getting back to General Grant and his order number 11, he regretted issuing that order. He apologized for it. And he tried to make amends when he became president. He actually um, appointed a number of Jews to important positions. And Jews actually supported his presidency for the most part. Grant appointed Simon Wolf to become Register of Deeds of the District of Columbia. Now, just a couple anecdotes about him before I move on to his book. In 1869, <clears throat> as Recorder of Deeds, uh, he got a letter from Frederick Douglass, Jr. Uh, who was applying to become a clerk at the Department of the uh, Recorder of Deeds. And the letter that Simon Wolf wrote to him said, your application is before me and has received favorable consideration. I see no reason in the world why you or your race should not have the full countenance in the struggle for progress in education. He later also wrote, a Jew must have no race or religious prejudices. In any case, he did give the job to Frederick Douglass, Jr. Now, another more famous anecdote was early in the Civil War, Wolfe learned that a Jewish soldier was to be executed the next morning for having deserted his unit. He had traveled to his mother's bed, deathbed to receive her last statements. Wolf went to the President Lincoln at two in the morning before the execution was to occur, and he asked Lincoln, if your dying mother had summoned you to her bedside to receive her last message, would you have been a deserter to her who gave you birth, rather than a deserter in law, but not in fact to the flag to which you had sworn allegiance? Well, Lincoln pardoned the soldier, telegraphed John Hay, his secretary, who, uh, and apparently the next day, the soldier rejoined his unit. <clears throat> now, getting back to the book uh, that Simon Wolf wrote, The American Jew is Patriot, Soldier, and Citizen. Now, he had researched, I told you he had come up with over 7,200 names. 
He did this research without any mass communication except newspapers. He put articles in newspapers that he was looking for names. And so people would write to him by mail uh, or he would interview them personally. Uh, he had a lot of misinformation, as you might expect. Uh, what we call errors of omission, errors of commission. And I'll talk about that in a second. So just getting back to Wisconsin soldiers, how many did Simon Wolf find? Well, he found 340 on his list, which when you consider the population, the Jewish population in Wisconsin at the time was somewhere between 1,600 and 2,000, that's an enormous number of soldiers. Uh, when I went through the list, and also, now I do this as a hobby, but there's a group called the Chappelle Manuscript Foundation, which have been hired, hired a research team to also look for all Jews from the entire country who served in the Civil War. And both of us have gone through Simon Wolf's list, and we found 16 of them who were definitely Jewish, 16 of this 340. We found about 89 who clearly were not Jewish, and 234 who just couldn't find evidence one way or another. Most likely they were not Jewish. When I say there were many heirs of commission, that means they named people who were not Jewish as Jewish. Heirs of omission means they missed Jewish soldiers, didn't put them on their list at all. Now, I've found so far 27 soldiers who I believe have a, a Jewish heritage, 25 of them very strongly, very strong evidence, I have no doubt about it. Two of them are a little iffy, I count them because I have more than two sources with their name. Um, and I couldn't find any really evidence to say no. That I have found some evidence of soldiers who were listed as Jewish where I, they clearly were not. Now, I found nine of my 27 were not on Simon Wolf's list. So there's a lot who he missed. So how many Jews actually did fight for Wisconsin? Now, the researchers for the Chappelle Foundation have so far found about 3% of the Jewish population have been proven, without a doubt, to have Jewish heritage about 1,738 Union troops, 1,353 Confederate troops. Now, I have to realize the Jewish population in 1860 was about 100,000, very small compared to the United States population. As I said, the Jewish population in Wisconsin was somewhere between 1,600 and 2,000. Interesting enough, uh, the sources both had the same author, a Rabbi Switchko. Uh, but they were in two different articles. <clears throat> he apparently must have found some different information in the six years between the two articles. But using that 3%, 3,000 out of 1,000, I looked at those numbers in Wisconsin and figured 3% of 1,600 and 2,000 would be somewhere between 48 and 60 Wisconsin soldiers, and I have found about 27. Now, just to compare that, though, with German immigrants, because most, and I'll show you that most of the Jewish soldiers were German immigrants, but German Jewish immigrants. German immigrants enlisted in a range from 7 to 14 percent, depending on the state that they were in. So, Jews, the 3 percent is less than that, and there's some reasons for that, which I'll go into. <clears throat> so the Jewish population in the year 1810 was 2,000, and it jumped to 100,000 just 50 years later, a 50-fold increase. Now, I think that shows that most of them were probably immigrants. They probably were freshly arrived. Germans, Jews, and Irish were all new immigrants at the time. They were all subject to hostile derision. Jewish soldiers often joined German units. 
as I said before, the population wasn't high enough to have a majority Jewish population anywhere in the country. Even in New York, where the Jewish population was highest, they still could not muster a majority uh, in those areas. The German and the Irish units initially received negative uh, feedback from their fighting abilities, uh, but later they started doing well and they got some encouragement. And so German families might encourage their sons to join the Union Army because of the positive feedback they were getting regarding German units or Irish units doing well. Jewish families did not have that same positive reinforcement because there were no real Jewish, uh, Jewish regiments or companies. Other things which might have affected uh, immigrant enlistment to begin with was whether they belonged to the Republican or Democratic Party. Republican uh, men tended to enlist in much higher numbers than Democrats. Republicans were much more supportive of the war than the Democrats were. Immigrants tended to be Democrat. Why was that? Because of the Know Nothing Party. If uh, any of you remember from your school days, the Know Nothing Party was the anti-immigration party. And they fell apart shortly before the Civil War, but most of the Know Nothings joined the Republican Party, and they made their voice heard. And that kind of made both Jews and Catholics somewhat weary about joining the Republican Party. Now, if you joined the Republican Party, you were much more likely to enlist. I, I think I said that. Now, how did Jews stand on slavery? We don't know. It's across the board. We know in 1861, a rabbi, Raphael, in New York, uh, gave a sermon which got published over the entire country. It defended slavery on biblical grounds. In response to that, a rabbi, Einhorn, out of Baltimore, wrote a serious um, rebuttal to that sermon saying that there was never any justification for slavery. So Jews were on both sides of the argument. Now I mentioned a lot of, a lot of the Jewish people uh, who came here were part of the German immigration of the 1848 revolutions from, in Germany. They would have tended to support the war in that they wanted to keep the country together but they weren't that keen on defending slavery or, uh, or fighting against slavery until they actually joined the military and they saw firsthand the evils of the institution of slavery. Then a lot of them changed their views, but not until after they had firsthand experience. <clears throat> now, why might Jews have been enlisting at a lower rate than other German uh, immigrants. As I said, German immigrants enlisted somewhere between 7 and 14 percent. Uh, the Chappelle group has found 3 percent of Jews have enlisted. Well, first of all, I think the number is probably greater than 3 percent. It's just difficulty in finding them, and I'll explain what that difficulty is. Also, the Chappelle Foundation uses a very strict criteria who, for who they consider Jewish. Of my 27, uh, they would not count two of them. They would only count 25. They're very strict on that. Other reasons, wage earners. If you're a wage earner, you're working in a factory, it's easy to give up your wage, enlist in the army, and get another salary. If you've started your own business and you've struggled to keep it going, and now this goes for any religion, not just Jewish, but if you've started your own business and you struggled to keep it going, you're less likely to give it up to join the army. And Jews as a group tended to be more self-employed and have their own businesses. So that might have been a little reason why a few less Jews might have enlisted. Pork. It was well known that pork was the major meat of the military during the Civil War. 
Now, if you were an observant Jew, you would have been very hesitant to enlist, because what are you going to eat? You know, you don't want to eat pork. But those Jews who did enlist ate pork. They had to. Uh, one guy wrote in a letter to home that he ate pork as medicine for President Lincoln. Some had no qualms about eating pork at all. There was a, a soldier by the name of August Bundy. He was a Kansas, in Kansas in the cavalry. He actually fought with John Brown. He fortunately did not go to Harper's Ferry with John Brown. He stayed in Kansas and joined the cavalry there. He was an exception to the rule. He actually had a farm. Most Jews did not farm, but he had a farm. He raised pigs. He slaughtered pigs. I have no doubt that he ate what he raised. Now, I mentioned before General Grant's order number 11. I brought that up because it has relevance. Before his order, which, as I said, was around the beginning of 1863, you know, December of 1862, 80% of all the Jews who enlisted enlisted before his order. After he gave that order, only another 20% enlisted. The word probably got around the Jewish population that were not really appreciated by the government, and that would have stifled enlistment. And there was one other thing, the shoddy scandals. What is shoddy? And we all know shoddy means it's not good. Well, shoddy is actually a word for recycled wool. Uh, poor people, and that would be Jews, Catholics, Irish Catholics, would go around, collect old wool rags, they'd shred them, and that would become shoddy. Now, you could add shoddy to fresh wool, and if you add up you know, a less than 7% shoddy to the rest being wool, the final product was pretty good. But if you went more than 7%, the product would fall apart easily. And that's where the word shoddy came out, because some dealers would add more than the 7%, and the uniforms would fall apart. Now, Jews often went into the clothing industry, so it was easy to project onto them that they were involved in the shoddy scandals, when in fact there were people of all ethnic groups who were involved in that. Probably the worst one of all was Brooks Brothers out of New York. They were a big company then. They made uniforms, and they were, <laughs> hate to say it, they were shoddy. Um, and they were not owned by Jewish people. They had been established early in the 1800s uh, by uh, Native Americans, or not, not Indians, uh, natural-born Americans at the time. Uh, they didn't become owned by a Jewish owner until 1948, I believe, a Jewish person bought up the company. <coughs> so these are two different cartoons which, although the Irish were involved in this, the Jews were involved in it, other people were involved in it, the Jews took the brunt of the propaganda. So we have on one side, we have a recruiting sergeant saying, come Moses, wrap up your patriotism and join the Union forces. And the Jew says, mein Gott, no. I have as much to do as to supply the army with good uniforms upon which I make nothing at all, so help me God. Of course, they've got the Jew in very fine clothing, like he's making a lot of money there. And then the other one is just simply, shoddy or the vulture of the camp with a very stereotypical Jewish profile. Jews, of course, saw this in the newspaper, and they saw that they were being, you know, negative feelings of the country toward them, a little less likely to volunteer. So in my research, who is a Jew? And there's several different definitions you can come up with. I probably use a little of each of these. <clears throat> a Jew is someone who practices the Jewish religion, Judaism. <clears throat> uh, this includes both converts and people who were born into the religion. Or it could be somebody who has Jewish ancestry and identifies as being Jewish. My father was Jewish, my mother was Jewish, I'm Jewish. 
regardless of how much they actually practice religion. And then a Jew is also somebody who, regardless of current religious identity, is directly descended from a Jewish ancestor. Now, of my 27, I actually have four people who never practiced Judaism, but clearly have a Jewish grandfather. So I count them as having Jewish heritage. And they, they would fit in with this uh, third definition. So problems I have uh, doing research. First of all, during the Civil War, unlike today, religion was never recorded during the Civil War. You know, nowadays they have dog tags, which have, you know, actually, uh, I think, I don't know if they used use J or they used he, H during uh, World War II, standing for Hebrew. Um, they weren't listed, uh, Jewish religions were not listed until the soldiers' homes came into existence. And on the records for the soldiers' homes, they actually have a slot for religion. But even there, most Jews were listed as Protestant. And I'll show you one example of that. Uh, very, very few people are actually listed as Jewish. I found maybe seven in homes out east where they were listed as Hebrew, but no one else. I, I went through all the rosters. Now, some Jews were born Jewish, but they might have converted to fit in or to get married. Uh, they might have been a result of a mixed marriage and not raised Jewish, or they might have uh, not practiced religion but still identified as Jewish. All sorts of different variations here. Uh, some may have given up their religion to become free thinkers, which is another term for atheists and non-believers. And then some change their names uh, for fear of anti-Semitism, possibly to avoid creditors, and that would include Jews and non-Jews alike. Um, and then another problem is names are not uniquely Jewish. This was Simon Wolf's problem. He used name profiling. If the name sounded Jewish, he put them on the list. Well, that's why in Wisconsin, there were like 30 or 40 soldiers whose names ended in S-O-N, like Samson, Isaacson, Jacobson. And when I went through their family histories, they were all Norwegian. They were not Jewish at all. Uh, if they were Norwegian, they weren't Jewish because Jews weren't allowed into Norway until 1855. <clears throat> Others, German names and Jewish names are often very similar. Likewise, I found Native Americans who Americanized, Anglicized their names often took biblical names, like Jacob Samson or something like that, or David Jacobs, names like that. And then another problem is, you know, if I've found some Jews who were buried in Jewish cemeteries. That's how I knew they were Jewish, uh, by finding their cemetery. But a lot of Jewish people were buried in non-sectarian cemeteries, and it would be impossible to know whether they were Jewish or not if there weren't some other records. <clears throat> so this is one example of a record from Wood Home of a man by the name of Louis Blum. I actually came across his cemetery, his grave at Anchilababit Cemetery. I was putting flags on graves for Memorial Day. And I saw that on his stone it said 82nd, I believe it says 82nd, yeah, 82nd Illinois Infantry. That was one of those, by the way, which was considered a Jewish regiment, uh, which wasn't. Uh, but he was Jewish. And his record on the top arrow there, right here, it clearly says his religion is Protestant. But, whoop, excuse me. But down here, in this corner here, I blew it up here, it says he's buried in Jewish cemetery in Milwaukee. Had he been buried at Wood National Cemetery, there's no way I would have found this guy. 
Now that's part of the difficulty. Uh, you know, they, their identity can be hidden. <clears throat> I mentioned that I had two soldiers who had kind of iffy uh, evidence. These are the two, uh, Arnold Rosenbaum and Pascal Pauli. Arnold Rosenbaum is listed in a book called The History of Jews of Milwaukee. Uh, in that book, there are about four other soldiers listed. They all turned out to be strongly, strong Jewish evidence. This other article with Pascal Pauli uh, mentions a Captain Gustav Goldsmith. This is an article, by the way, in the American Israelite by a Colonel A.G. Weissert. Uh, and it was on Jewish soldiers, and he was talking about Jewish soldiers from Wisconsin. He talked about Captain Gustav Goldsmith, uh, Alex Wetzler, which, by the way, was Metzler. He misspelled it. Uh, Philip Horwitz and Pascal Pauli. Now, I know for sure that Alex Metzler and Philip Horwitz are all definitely Jewish, clear evidence of that. I have good evidence that Gustav Goldsmith was not Jewish. He was on my list for a while, but I took him off. Uh, he got killed, I believe, at Chickamauga. His brother brought his body back. He's buried in a family plot at uh, Forest Home Cemetery in Milwaukee. I went to the cemetery to find out who else was buried in that plot and I did a search on them, and none of them had any evidence of being Jewish. Uh, two of the women were married in, by justices of the peace. One was married at the Episcopalian church. Um, and then I found also papers were being stored at the Milwaukee County Historical Society. And I was able to get into the family papers and look at them. There were letters from nephews and aunts. And they talked about celebrating Christmas. And there was even a hymn book from an evangelical uh, church. I, I ruled this guy out that uh, if he had Jewish heritage, it was well hidden and I couldn't figure it out, couldn't prove it. So I took him off my list, actually. So who are the 27 that I found? I'm not going to read them all, but those are the names. Uh, they're kind of scattered th among all the different units uh, of Wisconsin. If there's any units which had a majority, I'd say it's the 24th and 26th Wisconsin. They were Milwaukee units, which makes sense. That's where the Jewish population was. I'll talk about some of these, uh, but not all of them. So where were they from? Oop. As I said before, they were mostly immigrants. Most of them were born in Europe. <coughs> Uh, this map here, by the way, has stars. Uh, those are not where the people are from. Those are where there were revolutions in the 1848, 1849 time period. So what happened was a lot of these Jews were involved in these revolutions. The revolutions lost. And so there was an exile of over 600,000 German-speaking people, many of them coming to the United States, most of them coming to the United States, but not all of them. So in Wisconsin, of the 27 soldiers, nine of them were born in Prussia, one in Bavaria, five in Bohemia, which is German-speaking uh, Czech Republic. Two were from England. One was from France, but the one in France was from Salzburg, which is right on the border with Germany, and it's actually a German-speaking city. And then there was one from Holland. Seven were born in the United States. Uh, two of them were the Jefferson brothers, which I gave a talk on before. Their grandfather was from Germany uh, before the revolutions. Uh, their other grandfather I gave this talk before was Thomas Jefferson, and their grandmother was Sally Hemings. Then I had two from Wisconsin. They were first cousins. Uh, they were descendant of the first Jew in uh, Wisconsin, uh, who was uh, black name was Jacob Franks. And his nephew was John Law. And these were descendants of John Law. And they came from Canada. And they were fur traders. And I'll talk about them a little later. 
<clears throat> and then there were three who came up from Missouri, up the Mississippi, to settle in Wisconsin. And they had parents who came from Germany before the 48 revolutions. Where did the soldiers enlist? Well, as you can see, uh, biggest number enlisted in Milwaukee, not unusual. That's where the population was. What surprised me a little bit was La Crosse had as many as Dane County. Now, they weren't all living in La Crosse. Three of them were living in La Crosse. One of them was actually living in the Twin Cities. He's the only one I have who came from out of state to join, and only Jew who came from out of state to join a Wisconsin unit. He ran away from home from the Twin Cities to La Crosse, went down the river to La Crosse, enlisted. His father panicked, chased after him, got to La Crosse, begged the recruiting officer to let his son go home. And the recruiting officer says, no, he wants to be in the Army. He's in the Army. And he did serve out the whole time. Uh, Dane County, uh, two of them were the Jefferson brothers. Uh, one was uh, Charles Clauber, who lived in Madison. Another one lived in, uh, enlisted in Mazomany. I'm thinking, how did a Jew get to Mazomany? So I actually called the Mazomany Historical uh, Society and asked them if they knew anything about him. And they said, no, they knew nothing about him. But what they did tell me was, at the t beginning of the Civil War, there were a lot of teams coming in installing railroad tracks from out, you know, teams from out of the county. And while they were there, Lucius Fairchild, who eventually became governor, and he was in the military, came and gave an enlistment speech and got a lot of them to enlist. And it's likely that this one soldier enlisted. He was, he was probably a railroad worker who enlisted as a result of this talk. <clears throat> now, how many Jews identified as being Jewish? We know that 18 of the 27 that I have identified as being Jewish at the time they died, either because they were buried in a Jewish cemetery or they had family who were strongly Jewish. We know three intermarried and converted. We know four, as I mentioned, four never practiced Judaism but had a grandfather who were Jewish and two who are unknown. The two unknown I have are the two with the weakest evidence, by the way. So how many were buried in Jewish family? This is one way that I was able to find some of uh, the Jewish soldiers is where they were buried. And nine of them are buried in Jewish cemeteries. Two of them are in an unmarked battlefield grave. Two of them are in national cemeteries. One is in a state soldier's cemetery and 10 are in non-sectarian cemeteries. Three are unknown where they're buried. We know one went back to Germany. Um, he became quartermaster for the Kaiser, uh, ended up living out his life there and dying there. I have no idea where. Uh, this stone, by the way, uh, Nathan Neustadl was uh, killed at Chickamauga. He's buried in an unmarked battlefield grave, uh, but his parents erected this stone at Forest Home Cemetery in Milwaukee uh, in his memory. Fatalities, we know that there were about two and three quarters million soldiers who fought, and somewhere between 620,000 and 750,000 died. I think the more I read, the higher the number, and the higher number seems to be more accurate. Uh, that would be somewhere between 23 and 27 percent. Now, the Wisconsin Jews, five of the 27 died. That's about 19 percent. Because the numbers are small, I think that's probably in the ballpark. Who were the ones who died? As I said, Nathan Neustadl was killed at Chickamauga. Is buried on the battlefield as an unknown soldier. He does have the memorial at Forest Home. Arnold Rosenbaum was wounded at Kennesaw Mountain 
and he died of his wounds a week later. He's buried at Marietta National Cemetery in Georgia. Alexander Metzel was wounded at Gettysburg, died three weeks later. Uh, his brother brought his body back to Milwaukee. He's buried at Forest Home Cemetery. Then Pascal Pauli, he died of disease of rampant tuberculosis. He actually resigned on September 21st or 22nd and died a day or two later. Um, he is buried at Cypress Grove Cemetery in New Orleans, which is where he died. And then Gustav Mahler died of disease in uh, June of 1862. He too is buried somewhere in Virginia, but haven't been able to locate that. So disabilities, excuse me one second. Okay, disabilities during the war. I need to do more research on this, but what I did do was separate them, those who applied for disability pensions before 1871, those were very quickly after the war and probably very related to war injuries versus those who applied after 1880. They could have been related to war injuries, but I haven't had time. I would have to uh, get their records from the National Archives to find out really what their pensions were for. And I will do that at some point. But who were the three? There's three here who were definitely related to war injuries. So one was Jacob Levitt. Uh, he had the pension issued in 1871. He had coughing up blood. I call that symptoms of tuberculosis. Uh, it could have been something else, uh, but they, they didn't call it that back then. Uh, he did end up getting married after being discharged. He served, by the way, I believe in the 24th Wisconsin. Uh, he, in mid-1864, he transferred to become an assistant surgeon at the U.S. Military Hospital in Milwaukee. And it was from there a year later that he was discharged because of his lung disease. He got married shortly after that and was married at a Jewish synagogue. And he died in 1875. Is buried at this uh, cemetery in Milwaukee called Shrei Tzedek, also known as Hopkins Street Cemetery. Uh, for those of you from Milwaukee, uh, this is a cemetery which was went into disarray. Nobody took care of it. It's in the inner city. Uh, it was fenced off, bushes growing all over the place, stones deteriorated, you couldn't read them. Eventually, Congregation Emmanuel uh, took over the responsibility of taking care of it, cleaned up a lot of it. They got the names of all the people they could find and put them on one large block, and Jacob Levitt's name is on on the block uh, with about 70 some other names. And then we have Max Rosenheim. Uh, he had his pension issued in 1864 because he had his arm amputated. I guess that definitely merits a disability pension. Uh, he sold tobacco products, was married, and then she got separated, lived with his son. He died in Indianapolis and is buried at a Jewish cemetery in Indiana, Indianapolis. Uh, I always found this picture interesting. For those of you who aren't aware of anesthesia, uh, the guy at the head of the table here is administering anesthesia. They had ether or chloroform. Uh, the Union Army had plenty of it. Apparently the Southerners did not have as much as they wanted. But he's applying it there. And the last one who got a pension was issued in 1863. He was issued a pension for chronic pain. Again, I would have to get into his records, which I didn't get into yet. Uh, he was a tobacco wholesaler. In 1897, he overdosed on laudanum and died. Uh, it just goes to show that 
opiate addiction was probably very common after the Civil War. Uh, I've found other non-Jewish soldiers who also died of opium overdose. He too is buried at a Jewish cemetery in Chicago. So what kind of occupations did the soldiers have? And I think the, I mentioned that they tended to be in business for themselves and or they were merchants. And that's generally the case. They were business owners, uh, merchants. Uh, they often owned their own stores. Sometimes they were service, uh, in service occupations. What you don't find on here, with a couple exceptions, is anything dealing with agriculture. We had one who was a farmhand before the war, and one who raised racehorses. The one who raised racehorses was one of the Jefferson brothers. He was one of the ones who was never brought up Jewish, but had a Jewish grandfather. He was actually brought up at Monticello. <coughs> I want to mention a little bit about the Turner Society, uh, as they call it, the Turner Verein. It was established in 1811 by Frederick Ludwig Jahn, that's J-A-H-N, in Germany, to prepare youth for struggle against Napoleon and other forms of anti-democratic government. They used gymnastics to train the, the young men uh, in getting them fit athletically and to prepare them for military drills. This group, the Turner Verein, were involved in starting the 1848 liberal revolutions. And as I said before, as a result of the failure of these revolutions, over 600,000 of them ended up emigrating from Europe. Uh, that, by the way, is a picture of Turner Hall, as it exists today in Milwaukee. Um, I actually don't know if, how accurate that picture is on the interior, how it looks today. So the first Turner Societies in the United States were organized in 1848. They were known as the 48ers because they were part of the 48 revolutions. And their US motto was a sound mind in a sound body. The Milwaukee Turners received a charter from the state legislature in 1855, and they were opposed to the Know Nothing Party, which was anti-immigrant, and they were also opposed to slavery. And their national charter listed the following goals, liberty against all oppression, tolerance against all fanaticism, reason against all superstition, and justice against all exploitation. Of interest, they were one of the early groups to support women's suffrage, and they were also among the first German-American groups to denounce the atrocities of Hitler's Germany. So I bring this up because they were very involved in the Civil War. Um, many Turner members volunteered throughout the country in fact, a lot of northern societies had to disband because they lost so many members to enlistment. Now, several regiments in Wisconsin were composed wholly or in part of Turner's members, and they include the Wisconsin 5th, the 9th, and the 26th regiments, although many members joined other units. Now this picture here is of a memorial plaque. If you go to Turner Hall on 4th Street, the entrance is on 4th Street, and you go in the main lobby, there's a double staircase. You go up the staircase, half, half a flight, and you'll find this plaque. This plaque lists 24 members of the Turners who died during the Civil War. And on this list of 24, are three who I know are definitely Jewish. And they included Gustav Mahler, Alexander Metzel, and Nathan Neustadl, who I talked about before. I want to, how am I doing for time? Um, I'll finish up 
I want to talk about some interesting relatives. Now, realize that they didn't call soldiers boys for nothing. They were young men who hadn't established themselves yet in life. 18-year-old, 19-year-old, uh, fresh out of home. But they often did have some interesting relatives, so I thought I'd mention some of them. Like Charles Clauber. His brother, Samuel Clauber, was a prominent businessman in early Madison. He built the Clauber Block building. I don't know if you can read that there. That's on the square in Madison, across from the Capitol. Uh, he was appointed by Mayor Orton to solicit funds for families who lost their financial support because of the Civil War. And then I mentioned Nathan Neustadl. His father, Isaac, was an early leader in the <coughs> Milwaukee Jewish community. He helped found the German English Academy. Now this current building is known as the German English Academy building. That's on 1020 North Broadway in Milwaukee, still exists. This was not the original building though. The original building was built in 1851. And this was built in 1891, a re replacement. Now, Nathan, Isaac Neustadl also held the first <clears throat> um, the first Jewish ceremony uh, in Milwaukee. He had a number of Jews uh, come together for a Yom Kippur uh, service in 1847. That was in his home above his grocery store on, I believe it was 4th and Chestnut. Chestnut is now Juneau. Uh, Avenue in Milwaukee. That group eventually went on to form the first temple in Milwaukee, which was Emmanuel. And then we have Barnett Nathan, who had an uncle, Isaac Nathan, who was a well, relatively well-known composer at the time. He was a friend of Lord Byron, the poet, and he's known for putting Lord Byron's poetry to music often using music from his Sephardic synagogue in London. And then I mentioned before the two Jefferson brothers who were the grandsons of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. I gave a talk on them before. They also had a grandfather who was David Isaacs, who was a successful merchant in Charlottesville, Virginia. So the only thing I'll mention is did Thomas Jefferson and David Isaacs know each other? And the answer that, to that is a clear yes. In Thomas Jefferson's farm book, he has old Davy Isaacs listed and things that he bought from David Isaacs' store. One of the things he bought from the store was a ball of twine. And that ball of twine is important because he used that twine to lay out the foundation for the first building of the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. So, David Isaacs had something to do with that. And then we had Theodore Levy, whose father, John Levy, was elected mayor of La Crosse three times. He was a prominent businessman. He was also elected alderman eight times and cantor at the synagogue in La Crosse. And then we have Rene Schlesinger, whose uncle, Baruch Schlesinger, founded the town of Slinger. It was originally called Slicingerville, but nobody could pronounce it or spell it. So they lopped off eight letters and le left Slinger in its place. And uh, so that's how Slinger got to be known as Slinger. Uh, he served on the state senate and assembly. He was also on the committee to form the state constitution. And he was a brigadier general in the state militia. <clears throat> And then we have the two law brothers. They were not brought up Jewish, but they have a Jewish grandfather. They have a lot of interesting people in their family history. Benjamin Franks, their five greats, great, 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 great grandfather, was a crew member for Captain Kidd in, 18, in 1675. There's actually a book on Jewish pirates of the Caribbean, a very well uh, researched book, by the way. Abraham Franks. Great, great, great grandfather founded Canada's first synagogue in around 1760. Jacob Franks was the first Jew in Wisconsin. He settled in Green Bay. He was a fur trader from Canada 
around 1790-ish. He did so well, he invited his nephew, John Law, as his sister's son. His sister married a person by the name of Law. And he joined the group. And then John Law was the father to John D. Law, the soldier. Up here, the two soldiers. He was the father of John and the uncle of Joseph. And George Law founded Kakana. He bought up the land, platted it, and then formed the city of Kakana. And he donated the land that uh, became Lawrence University. Now, uh, one other thing I want to talk about, like if that isn't enough, around 1813, Jacob Franks goes back to Montreal, leaving the business in the hands of John Law. Now, John Law wanted to practice Judaism, but the nearest synagogue was in Cincinnati, a little too far to go. So he converted and joined the Episcopal Church. Now, he married a woman by the name of Teresa Rankin. She was half Indian, and she went also by the name of Nikikakwa. Now, that's the soldier's grandmother. Her mother, the soldier's great-grandmother, uh, went by the name of Weyong Winning. She was the daughter of an Ottawa chieftain who would be the great-great-grandfather of the soldiers, and his name was Ashwabamis. Now, in case any of you are familiar with Green Bay, there's a town called Ashwabanon, and it's believed that Ashwabanon is named after Ashwabamis, which is a great-great-grandfather of the two soldiers. That's within walking distance of Lambeau Field. Uh, you can take that trivia with $3 and go to Starbucks and get a cup of coffee. Uh, not all the soldiers uh, participated as a soldier, although th this guy did both. Uh, Benjamin uh, Bornheim, he had a clothing store in Janesville. And at the beginning of the war, this, this ad came out. And I don't know if you, whoops, whoops. All right down here, this ad here, I'll read it because it's pretty small. It said, this company has been sworn into service. Oh, and they were talking about the Janesville Fire Suaves. This company has been sworn into service of the United States, has received its tents and camp equippings. The members have received their uniforms and tire. Some 25 more men are needed to fill the company to the required number. For the purpose of getting these men, a recruiting officer for this company will be found at the clothing store of B. Bornheim until the required number is obtained. And signed by William Britton, captain. So he was involved in helping establish uh, enlistment um, in the city of Janesville. He eventually did join the 5th Wisconsin himself and served out to the end of the war. Uh, just to let you know that he was indeed an immigrant. This is his obituary. He did eventually move to Baltimore. You can probably see that's German. Uh, his obituary was in German in Baltimore. I'm going to skip uh, through some of these here. Uh, this one was just interesting because it shows difficulty <laughs> in researching. Uh, this was on Alexander Metzel, who was one of the ones who died in the Civil War, and his name is on the plaque at Turner Hall. But his sister, uh, Rose, uh, ended up, uh, Rose Metzel ended up marrying a guy by the name of uh, Jacob Louie or Levy, because here they spell L-E-W-E-Y, which would have been pronounced Levy in German, and it's crossed out, and L-E-V-Y is written above it. That's a marriage certificate with a cross out on it. Later, after the mother of the soldier wanted to get a mother's pension, and Rosa writes a letter in support of her mother getting the pension. And she starts out with this deposition, I, Rosa Lewis, it's now L-O-U-I-S, not Levy or Louis, 
and she signs it Rosa Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. So she spells her name differently at the top and the bottom. So we have two different documents with four different spellings of her last name. Uh, that's kind of the difficulty you have in doing Civil War research. Uh, this is the only evidence of anti-Semitism that I found in my research. This was um, Philip Horwitz, who was a major in the 26th Wisconsin, and his wife was applying for a widow's pension. Uh, she wrote this, which said, I have acquired the best testimony possible in this case. To begin with, there was strong prejudice against the soldier by some in the same regiment. That's the only evidence of anti-Semitism I was able to find of all the different research I've done in, in Wisconsin soldiers. Uh, this guy's kind of interesting because he was 51 years old when he married 19-year-old Rosa Stroud. Uh, they went into business together. She knit clothing goods, and he manufactured women's underwear. Um, and. Uh, they went from eight employees uh, to begin with and ended up with 50 to 75 employees five years later. So it was a booming business. And I think I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to quit here and take questions. Thank you.